also be on the screen, but hopefully you have a copy of God's Word that you're bringing and using. Um, and if you're using your phone, I encourage you to do not disturb it, make it do not disturb, or whatever you need to do to reduce distractions. I don't know about you, but I usually go to my phone because I think I need to do something, and half an hour later I realize I haven't yet done that. And that's, uh, that's a lack of discipline on my part, for sure. So I'm calling myself out publicly so you can check in and see how I'm doing. Um, we are continuing our series through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Sermon on the Mount. We're calling the series Jesus Manifesto because Jesus is laying out his plan for his kingdom, his ideals, his values, his purposes, how he's going to do it, and he's going to challenge the culture in the midst of that. Okay, in the next few weeks, we're going to see that he is going to challenge the traditions of men that have been built around the word, and he's going to come at that pretty hard for the rest of chapter 5. Today is an introduction to that piece. Okay, so verses 17, 18, 19, and 20, he's going to give us, Jesus is going to give us four truths, okay, that explain why Jesus has confidence in the Word of God, why Jesus, and what Jesus really believed about the Bible. And that's what we're going to answer, that's the question we're really asking today is, what did Jesus believe about the Bible? There's, there's a connection between what you think about Jesus and his authority and what we think about God's word and its authority. And the connection is pretty simple. If you value Jesus and what he says, then you cannot come away and not value the word because he held it very high. He had a very high view of scripture. Okay? And the two go together. So we're going to see how that plays out. All the letters are read in my Bible, which means that Jesus is the only one talking here. So let's kind of get, let's get to what he had to say. Let's hear it. And uh, um, let's, let's give it our attention and our, and our heart. Here's a question, though, I do want to ask as I begin. I heard this question from somebody else, and I thought, I'm just going to ask the question because I think it's a great question. Um, I need to be asked this question when I'm sitting out there. What do you plan to do with this sermon? Okay, and I know you don't know the answer to that yet, but it's funny how many times I've sat down to listen to a sermon and I have not even considered that question. I haven't even considered that I should ask the question. So my question to you is, what are you going to do with what you hear today? And then I'll ask that question again at the end in a different way. But with that, let's jump in and let's see what Jesus has to say at this part. He's already given us the, 12, the first 12 verses. He's given us the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes show us a picture of what it looks like for someone who is in the kingdom of light what they look like when they follow the, the word, when they walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then last week we saw where Ken unpacked who we are in Christ, our partial, another identity. We are salt, we are light, and therefore if you're salt, you go be salty. If you're light, you go shine, and that's what you do because that's who you are. And today he's going to now turn and he's going to start to come into and talk about the issue that, quite honestly, the religious leaders have been shocked he hasn't mentioned so far. They've been shocked about what he said, but what they may have been more shocked about is what he hasn't said yet. He hasn't said, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. He hasn't given them a bunch of rules, and they had, let's see, 248 do's and 365 don'ts or something like that, and he hadn't even gotten there. And then when he gets there, they're really going to get irate. So with that, let's find out what, what did Jesus think about the Bible? Verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, Anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then he ends with this zinger. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word, 
My job is just to shine a spotlight on it and help us understand it, help us remember it, and help us answer the question, what am I supposed to do with this? Give us the courage to ask those questions, give us the discipline to follow through, and give us the understanding to comprehend what we're about to hear. May your spirit have his way in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So um, my, big, my big idea today is um, four parts because it comes with the four verses. And it all really answers the questions, those four truths that I was referring to. The four truths that, um, that explain why Jesus believes the Bible. And those four, I'm looking for them because I want to make sure I don't butcher them are that, number one, and, this, and these go with the verses, 17, 18, 19, 20, right in order, that Jesus is the central point of the scriptures. It all points to him, and he is therefore the point. Um, and number two, that every detail in the scriptures, in the Bible, is perfect. It's reliable, and therefore it's trustworthy. The third is that we are to obey it and to teach others to obey it. Okay, so we're to obey it or practice it, do it, but we're also supposed to pass it on. And then the last thing is that the focus of the law or the focus of the word is on the spirit of the law and the heart of the law. Okay, so with that, let's unpack those ideas so that you can kind of get an idea of what it's saying. I'm going to show it to you in the scripture so that you won't have to take my word for it. You can see it there. And if what I say doesn't line up, always go with what the Bible says over what anybody else says. Jesus has a very high view of scripture. He is referred to in the scriptures as the living word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that's John first 18 verses of his book where he talks about Jesus and he calls him the word. So we look at Jesus and we go, that's the living word. He is the living word. We hold this up and we say, this is the written word. This is what Jesus left us by the um, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God breathed. God, if God could say anything to us, well, we already know what he would say because he already has said it. Um, now, the scriptures... The Bible, when, when Jesus is talking in this passage, let, let, me just, let me just make this real clear for us. He's referring to his Bible. And in his day, there was no such thing as a New Testament, a new covenant hadn't been proclaimed other than what he'd already said up to this point, which he proclaims pretty early in his ministry. So he's referring to his Bible. So what Bible did Jesus use? Jesus used the Hebrew Bible. He used what we would call the Old Testament. Okay? The scriptures, the word. He called it the law or the prophets. The law and the prophets together is another way to collectively refer to all the writings in the first two-thirds of your Bible if you have Old and New Testaments enclosed. But he's not leaving out the New Testament, and he refers to that in John, and I'll show you that in a minute, why I say that. But it hasn't been written yet. But he knows this, of course. His spirit is going to speak through men and women, get it on paper, distribute it to the world in such a way that it is not only inspired in the original manuscripts, but that even though it's copied with, with imper by imperfect people, he oversees the, the copying and the distribution and even the translations of today in such a way that we can hold our Bibles with confidence that we have essentially what he said in those words. Is this a, a copy of the original manuscripts? It is not. It is a copy of the copies of the original manuscript. Can you imagine if we had the original manuscript today? Where would it be? I don't know exactly where it would be, but there would be people bowing down to that book, worshiping that book, which is not what Jesus called us to do. And I think that's why we don't have a copy. The copy, I mean, the originals. Probably be a lot of blood had been shed over the originals too. There's enough blood already shared over the copies. So he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So I was sitting out at, um, what park is that? Old, Fort, Old Dorchester State Park, is that what it's called? So I was sitting out there going over this today at a picnic table. And um, 
all of a sudden I get tackled by Molly and Daniel because they saw me and came running across. They were out doing some cool things. And, um, but I was just there. I was just working on this out loud. And I like to be where I can say it out loud and not bother anybody else. But I bother you guys. That's, you get the privilege of hearing me bother you. And I, and I was looking for acorn, an acorn all week, and I found one right there by my seat. And so I was looking at this word, abolish, and I didn't come up with this picture. I think it's a great picture. But, um, you know, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. So there's two, abolish means to destroy. So there's two ways I could destroy this acorn. The first way is pretty obvious. I could put it on the floor and I could stomp on it and twist it and crunch it into oblivion. I could take a hammer to it. I could take two bricks and smash it in between and abolish this acorn. Or I could plant it. And as it germinates and life springs from death, the shell will just fall apart and crumble and disintegrate and be abolished, but there would be something in its place, wouldn't there? It would become the means to life. It would become the means to something that would really be a fulfillment of what this was designed to do and be, wouldn't it? Because this isn't going to grow a big acorn. <laughs> this is going to grow an oak tree. It's going to have more, and it's going to yield more and more and more. That's the law in a nutshell. Sorry, I had to say that. Isn't it cool how God, it's almost like God designed it that way. Yeah. He is so brilliant that he takes the ordinary things in our life and he puts them right in front of us and we see them all the time and we just take them for granted. And then he shows us something like that and it's like, wow. So that's why he invented acorns. <laughs> so that in 2019, Darren could use it as a sermon illustration. No, he's much bigger than that. But the truth, right? And so when we think about the law, I think we tend to think negative thoughts. I don't know about you, but when I see blue lights in my rearview mirror, I think negative thoughts, sometimes out loud. And it's just not a pretty picture because, you know, I don't like the blue lights chasing me down. We think of the law, but what is, he, what is he doing? He's enforcing that which our society has agreed is good and right. Okay? God has given us the law, okay, because it shows us the way to go. Okay, it's like train tracks. The train tracks make it very clear which way the train should go, or the train will go. Okay? The only question is, will the train be moving? And then something else fuels that. But the direction is laid out for it in advance. It's clear. So he says, do not think about, I've not come to a boss, but to fulfill it. Jesus it is, has done a lot of things to upset the religious leaders. They think he's coming to trash the law. He's criticizing the way they're interpreting and, and applying the law left and right. And he's going to do it in ink here and in just in a few, all, all the rest of chapter 5. And so they're, they're like, well, this guy's a renegade. This guy, he's, he's talking like he has authority. Of course, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they do have authority. The scribes are ordained by, at age 40. The formal ordination occurs. That's the teachers of the law refers to here. Pharisees, a lot of times, would choose future Pharisees out of the scribes. So these, these were the one-two punch when it came to the law. The scribes were very much interpretation, uh, interpretation of the law, application of the law. Pharisees were about the observation of the law. Are you actually doing it right? And we're kind of the law police. And so they were all about following the letter of the law, the outward, external playing out of the law, which... The law is giving us what we should do, and if we're not doing it, accountability is a good thing. We've already heard that. But they were missing the kernel of the law, the part that really will, that's the part that's alive. That's where the, the life comes from, and it's by grace. And so Jesus makes that, he makes that point um, pretty strongly here. Now, I wanted to mention the New Testament. So how does that fit in? Because if we're going to talk about the law, as an, which is another way of saying the Bible, the word, how do, you, how do you bring in the New Testament? So I want you to turn. We're going to look at a few other verses here. So if you get your sword drill hands out. Uh, John 16, starting in verse 12. I want to read this. This is Jesus speaking here as well. It's the night he was betrayed, and then the next day he'll go to the cross. 
So it's Thursday night. He's spending a lot of time with the 12 minus Judas, who leaves at some point. And, and they're freaking out because Jesus is like, I'm going, to, I'm going to die. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be betrayed by one of you. And they're, they're struggling. He's already had to tell them, he, you know, he's already predicted Jesus' denial in chapter 13. He really ruffled the feathers when he washed their feet. So then he comforts them in 14, 15. He teaches about the branches and the vine. In 16, he, he starts talking about the Holy Spirit. And the reason he's talking about the Holy Spirit is because Jesus is about to leave, and they're going to feel like orphans. And he's like, I'm not leaving you as orphans. You're going to have the Spirit of God living in you. I'm going to be with you. My Spirit will be inside of you. Okay. And here's what's going to happen as a result of that. Verse 12, I have much more to say to you, guys, disciples, 12, 11, more than you can bear now, now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Not may, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come, future. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. In other words, he's getting his words from the word. All that belongs to the Father is mine. God, God has given that to him. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. And that's how the Bible was written. That's how the New Testament was written. He wrote it through men and, and maybe even some women, depending on how it was put together. He spoke through people, through this power of the Spirit, through their, using their personalities and their bad grammar skills. Peter's was, Greek was not so good. Luke's was fantastic. And even through those imperfections, God sovereignly wrote truth in such a way that we could access it and not be misled by it when we're following it with, by faith with our heart, our whole heart. That's, that's powerful. That's amazing. That should give us incredible confidence in, in, the, in the Word. Um, in our class that I teach, um, once a, a couple of times a week, I teach a class, Bible History and, and Logic, to a bunch of 7th and 8th graders. And one of the things they learned this week was that there's over 24,000 copies, partial copies of the New Testament. You're talking about ancient literature, 2,000 years old. And there's over 2,000 co fragment copies. That means partial copies. It could be a lot of the New Testament. It could be a par small piece of the New Testament. The second best document or liter piece of literature has like 700 copies. I think it's Homer's Iliad. Maybe it's Odyssey. I think it's Iliad. It's incredibly well documented. And what's so amazing is how well they agree. Now, the Old Testament obviously goes back another 1,500 plus years, but the same is true. We find not as many copies, but we find an amazing consistency. It's like God was working because he was. I mean, if God's going to go to the trouble to communicate to us, you would think he would need to do it accurately and in a way that was reliable. Otherwise, what do we know? How do we know what's true and what isn't? How do we know what we can have confidence in? And if I can't have confidence in all of it, I really don't have any confidence in, in much of it at all. And yet, that's where many people are. And I, and I, I understand that, and, and I, I sympathize with that. I'm just grateful that that's not where I've landed. I'm grateful for men like Billy Graham who landed on this is the word of God and I'm putting my life on it. He made that decision early in his career, right when his ministry was blowing up and, and people were coming in the tens of thousands to hear him for weeks in, in California. And he goes out into the woods because he has this crisis of faith and he puts his Bible on a stump and he prays and he comes away going, this is the word of God. I am convinced and I'm going to live as if, I'm, if I, as if I'm convinced. And he did. And the rest is history. Probably nobody has spoken the word of God to more people on the planet than Billy Graham. Literally heard around the world at times at the same time as he broadcast through satellite television. You and I have a decision to make, and it's, do I trust the word of God? Do I believe that it's trustworthy? Jesus says, it is trustworthy. It is perfect and useful in, it, in, in every way, and for what it's intended. Um, 
The second thing I wanted you to see, to see is, well, the first point was that he was the central message, and the second is that it's perfect in every detail, which is where I'm going now. Um, and I hate this, that my papers are scrambled, so I'm just going to go with it. Let's just pull one sheet out and not turn pages. Okay, so um, the second verse says, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Boy, that statement is loaded, is it not? Something's going to happen that is cataclysmic. It's going to be so big, it's going to affect heaven and earth. Now there's at least three heavens, as mentioned in Scripture, there's the sky, there's space, and then there's the heavens we can't see that's in probably a dimension we just can't register on our senses because we're limited and the spirit world is beyond us in that regard. But we'll be there at some point. New heaven, new earth, it's coming. That's spoken of in more than one place in the New Testament. God is going to redo what he's done here. He's going to make a heaven and earth where there is no sin, there is no, um, there is no shame, there is no death, there are no tears, and, and all of that, and more. Before that happens, he's saying everything in here is going to be fulfilled. So think about that. It's the, the prophecies of Christ. That's the teachings of Christ. That's the things he did. Okay? It's his death and it's his disciples, the things that, they, that we carry on until he comes back. For truly I tell you, truly I tell you is his signature. That's like Jesus saying, like scribbling his signature on, on a document. It seals it legally. He's saying, this is, make no mistake, I am saying this very, very strongly. I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear. Smallest letter, think about our alphabet. A small I is probably our small letter. The Hebrew letter Yod is the letter there that he actually says in the original language. Smallest stroke, uh, the, the the Hebrew phrase is tittle. It's a, it's a stroke. So like it's what stroke you might add to, a, to an O to make it a Q, that little that would be, he says, not the least bit of the law, not the least bit of ink, okay, is what he's really saying, it, it, you know, is going to disappear until I fulfill it. It tells us how, how rock solid it is we can count on it. Jesus is counting on it. Jesus is fulfilling it. He's saying to those religious leaders, you think I've come to destroy it? I have not. In fact, I've come to fulfill it like that acorn fulfills its um, is being, it fulfills the life of the oak tree by allowing itself to be destroyed so that what God intends and what is best for us can, can be made known, accessible to us. And so I just, I just love that. I think that's awesome. Now, um, uh, let's see. Um, so when he talks about, okay, well, he's going to get into the next one. So verse 19. Okay, we've, we've seen verse 17 and 18. Therefore, whenever you see the word therefore in Scripture, you always ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore? All right? Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, which is synonym for kingdom of God. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So clearly he's saying we need to practice or obey the word and we need to teach others. And I would include training in that, as Paul does in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scriptures God breathed and profitable for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Doing it. It is designed to be heard and it's designed to be practiced and shared and passed on. Okay, that's the, the parable, and he'll get to it in chapter 7, verse 24, where he talks about the wise and foolish builders, and he talks about the wise man is the one who built his house on the rock, and that's the equivalent of somebody who hears the word of God and does what it says, as opposed to the one who hears the word of God and then walks out and does nothing. That's why I asked that question at the beginning. What are you going to do with this? What is God saying to you today as you hear this? What is it in your heart, in your mind, that moves you to act in a way that maybe you wouldn't have acted otherwise, except that you're like, well, God's speaking to me. I must 
take that seriously. If you believe that God speaks, and he certainly speaks through his word, he certainly speaks through his people, we know he speaks through his spirit, so the question is, are you going to continue to uh, lean into that and follow that and act on that? Or are you going to continue, if you haven't been doing that, to do nothing? That's dangerous. Because how did the man who built his house on the sand, how did that end up? His house fell with a great crash and was totally demolished. Chapter 7, verse 25, the rain came down. And the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, yet it did not fail. That's the one who built his house on the rock. Because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and, the, and it beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I was re- looking at that verse in... Um, I was looking at discipline and self-control earlier. And um, Proverbs 28, 25, 25, 28. Um, one of those, 28, 25, I think. And he says that um, a city, a, a man without self-control, a person without self-control is like a city without walls. And so that, that says something to us, but I liked the message, trans, uh, the, the message paraphrased it this way. The person who does not um, have self-control is like a house with the windows and the doors knocked out. Now, can you imagine walking up to your house and all the windows have been blown out and the door is laying flat on the ground and it's open? Would you feel comfortable sleeping in that house tonight? You'd feel like, uh, I'm going to get the Motel 6, thank you very much. Why? Because you feel vulnerable. And that's the point. When we live undisciplined, unaccountable, unself-controlled lives then we're, we, are, we are vulnerable to that. Apparently that was for somebody because that is not in my notes. So, uh, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments is least. So what does that say about the commands in the, in the Scriptures? And he's talking about the Hebrew Bible, in particular the Old Testament, you know, the, one, the two-thirds that we typically ignore. He's talking about that. You realize that, right? So what do we do with that? Do we really obey that? I mean, do I really need to um, never get a tattoo? Do I um, need, if I'm going to be a slave to my owner voluntarily, do I need to get my ear pierced? Just one ear, thank you very much, and use a, a nail and a hammer because um, it's quicker. You know, that's how they did it. So we have to, is, are we supposed to, to go on our roof and put an 18-inch high handrail all the way around? Are we supposed to do that? I mean, it says it in, in, the, Hebrew ty- in the Hebrew Bible. So, so um, we're supposed to obey the word, but we are supposed to obey the word as it's intended to be obeyed. And that means that we need to recognize, first and foremost, that all scripture is written to a people in a specific time in history. It's first for them. And then from that, we lift the principles that are timeless, the truths that are in there that don't need a date to be applicable. Okay? So there's basically three categories, as I understand it, of law in the Old Testament. There's the moral law, there's the ceremonial law, and there's the civil law or civic law. Civic law or civil law was like building code things, like I was talking about. You know, they had flat roofs most of the time. So if you're going to use the roof of your house as a room, and they did, that was, you know, smart, um, you probably ought to have a handrail up there for Junior who might get up there once in a while. 18 inches is about right. He can stand up there and hang on and look out and see everything. You know, it reminds you, don't take another step. Your foot bumps against it so you don't fall over the edge. It's just a safety thing. And so they built it into their national, the word was just, God just built it in. And they probably wrote a lot more building code kinds of laws or things like that in their code beyond the word because they saw the principle of you need to be smart and you need to ask everybody to follow some rules so that in society things are uniform and and therefore safer. And that's just one of the many ways God graced Israel in ways he didn't grace other nations. So that's the civic law. The ceremonial law. Remember all those sacrifices that they would sacrifice over and over? Goats and pigeons and bulls and sheep and and, and all the blood. And it's like, oh my goodness, they're driving me crazy. All these sacrifices. But what were they doing? God was teaching them that there can be no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. That's the first thing. And then he says, he's foreshadowing the fact that really all that sacrifice that they were doing really doesn't do any good, except that it foreshadows the one sacrifice that makes all the difference, and that is that Jesus, a person, 
sacrifice by his father so that we could truly begin receive forgiveness of sins through the shedding of blood. But the difference was, he wasn't an animal, obviously. He was a human. And to substitute for a human, you have to put a human in there. You have to make that happen. That's the substitutionary atonement that Scripture teaches. And as a result of the atonement, I can be at one with God, at one meant with God. Because he takes my place. He takes my sins. He took my punishment. The punishment I deserved fell on Jesus. That's what it means when it says he was cursed. So do we obey those commands? The moral law. The, so the ceremonial law has to do with the sacrificial system and the priestly system. And that was for a specific nation, Israel, for a specific purpose, the religion of that nation of the people of Israel, but it wasn't for everybody for all times because Jesus came to make that universal. Jesus came for the, for the whole world, and, and even though that was mentioned over and over in the scriptures, it was still limited to those who would come and do it through Israel and the one temple in all of the world where that happened, the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem that's still under there somewhere. And then you have the moral law. Now, this is the law that still stands. This is... Ten Commandments. This is principles and truths that are in throughout the, the Old, Old Testament scriptures that um, we see reflected and repeated and quoted in the New Testament by Jesus and others. That's why our Bibles, the, our Christian Bible, the New Testament, likes to attach the Hebrew Bible to the front and call it the Bible because it's all God's word, it's all reliable, but it's not all applicable to us today. The civic law, the ceremonial law, it's been, um, fulfill, it's fulfilled its purpose. Its purpose is complete. The moral law, not. We still do that, sorry. That's, that's why Jesus um, quotes nine of the Ten Commandments and says, you know, repeats them in some form or fashion in his teachings. And the, the Sabbath means rest, and that principle is all through Scripture. Just look at the word abide, and you find rest uh, John 15, for example, this is a classic passage on that, on that word. So we obey the word. Now, this is where um, we, we, we might be in, tempted to kind of blow off some of this because you think, well, I have to, you mean I'm, I'm obeying all of this? And, and I would say, yeah, you are. Well, how do I do that? This is a lot of pages. And, and I know I read through it every year. It takes me a year. I work through it. Four chapters a day, year after year after year, and every year I read stuff I don't remember ever reading. So how in the world are you supposed to keep up with all those words and commands and all of that? And this is the beauty of the new covenant. Look at, I didn't tell you guys this one, sorry, Jeremiah 31, where Jeremiah, an Old Testament prophet, tells us about the New Testament that's coming, the new covenant that's coming. I think it's in 31, starting in verse 31, I think. Yep. I love to hear those pages turning. It's beautiful. Jeremiah, one of the thundering, well, he's the weeping prophet is actually what he's called. He's the last prophet right before Israel goes into exile, when they cease to be a nation for a very long time. And he writes this, and I think this would have been very encouraging to those who had been in exile, exiled to Babylon. And he writes, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. So Israel and Judah together is Israel, the, the, whole, the whole 12 tribes. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, the original covenant, the old covenants. I made with their, uh, when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. And that's the classic passage he always goes back to, right? He goes back to Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Who is God? I am the Lord your God. What did I do? I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery, okay? The Bible does not teach slavery is okay or God wouldn't have rescued his own people out of slavery. Hello, people don't understand when they read it. When that slavery is there, it's culturally context and you can't fix everything on day one, okay? And there are bigger fish to fry than fixing slavery on day one, okay? Took us longer than it should have, but nevertheless, 
That is not God's heart that we would be. And yet, we're called bond servants to Christ. So what a great way for us to learn what that looks like. I'm sorry, I, I got off track again. This is the, co- verse 33, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. So here it is, the new covenant. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. That almost sounds like osmosis. I'm, I'm liking this. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the new covenant in the Old Testament words. And so how does he do that? He does that, like he said in John 16, when we talked about the counselor, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth. He puts in our hearts, when we trust Christ, the power, the access, the one who who holds our hand and helps us obey what it says here. Okay? So, I, what this means is it's possible for you to obey the word of God and not even know it because you're walking in step with the spirit of God. Isn't that a beautiful thought? You've seen this happen when a young child comes to know Christ and they start saying things and you're like, wow, that's profound. I need to write that down. My six-year-old's killing it. You know, or, or a seven-year-old forgives the sibling and you're like, my husband hasn't figured that one out yet. That's amazing. You know, confession? What is this? And it's God's spirit freely working in the heart and mind of the person. Okay? Us older Christians who've been doing this a while, we've figured out how to kind of dampen that. And our heart gets crusty around the edges because we're not always as quick to obey as we should be. And so we wonder why we don't have this sensitive heart. We don't always hear the voice of God. It's because we don't always cooperate. But he is always showing us how to obey the small commands and the big commands. There's something in here I want to share with you guys. There's a guy named Charles Quarles, okay? And the guy had some amazing things to say here about um, what Jesus is getting at here. Here it is right here. This is awesome. So he says, basically, when he's talking about the word, he's saying that there's this, oh, this goes with verse 20. All right, so let me read verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, teachers of the law are scribes, so Pharisees and scribes, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That sounds like something I need to write down, right? I mean, like, what? there's, okay, so here's how I don't get into the, the kingdom of heaven. How? My righteousness must exceed the most holy men who ever walked the planet according to the people in Israel at the time. So we have the chosen people of God, Israel, the Jews. We have their religious teachers, the Pharisees and the scribes, who are experts in the law of God. And they have this righteousness because they're really, really, really good at keeping the law. Like when they grow a little herb garden, you know how you can buy those little ones for your kitchen now, and they got the little fluorescent light, and you grow your basil, and you snip off some so you can look like um, emerald in the kitchen, right? And they would tithe... The first fruit from their herb garden. Kid you not. Snip off 10% and take it to the temple. But they wouldn't be just and merciful when it came to things that really mattered. He speaks to that. Quarles says, superior righteousness focuses on, he gives me four things. Okay? And these are going to correlate with these verses as well. First thing, superior righteousness focuses on the spirit of the law, not merely the letter of the law. Okay? So, for example, um, Jesus will say, and we'll look at this probably in the next week or two, Jesus said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. One of the Ten Commandments, probably heard of it. But I tell you, if you've hated your brother, can you see me hate somebody? Probably I can hide that for a little while. But if you've hated someone in your heart, it's murder in God's eyes. You've committed murder. Give me another example. Um, uh, Never committed adultery, but if I've ever lusted after somebody, can't see that outwardly either. Jesus says it's like you've committed adultery. So you see, he's saying the letter of the law, the external, sure, everybody can measure that. You can, either you've murdered somebody or you haven't. Either there's a body laying there or there's not. Either you've committed adultery or... Or you haven't. And yeah, you're eventually going to get caught. It's just a matter of when. So it's external. He's, it's like, it's not just about the outside. It's about the inside. The heart. 
So he's going, I'm so glad you didn't just swear in church, because I mean, that's not really a good place. If you're going to do it, you probably should do it at work, not at at church, right? But we we go, oh, I'm patting myself on the back because I thought the word, but I didn't say it out loud. And God's like, you said it, I heard it, because I can hear what you think. Consequences might not be the same. Yeah, I shielded your children because I gave you enough to not say it, but you still said it in your heart. There was something in your heart that welled up that caused you to almost say it. I want you to walk with me so closely that you don't even want to say it. That when you hit your thumb with the hammer, that's not the first word that comes to mind. That's a heart level. That's not the letter of the law. And another superior righteousness focus on internal matters, which we've talked about, rather than external. Same idea. Sup- the third one, super righteousness focuses on more important matters of the law rather than minor points of the law. I'm not going to equate tithing my herb garden with lusting after somebody. Or, ju- and his example is justice, being just, right? Standing up for the poor in court. Standing up for, for the person who doesn't have power in the court of law, where the corruption tends to happen. I'm going to show mercy to the people who, who need to see mercy. That matters to God more. You say, well, they're both God's word. They're both the law. Yes, they are, but they are not the same in God's eyes. That's why he tells them, you give me these sacrifices and you, you celebrate my feasts. I want you to do justice. Love mercy, walk humbly with me. The whole chapter of Isaiah 58 is all about what does true fasting look like? Israel was fasting before God. They were doing it externally. They weren't doing it because they wanted to go to know God any better, and he was calling them out. Whole chapter, you ought to read Isaiah 58. It's, um, it's, it's very convicting. And the fourth one, superior righteousness focuses on manifesting divine character rather than merely keeping divine commands. Now, we obviously want to keep divine commands. We want to obey the law. But if your character isn't following, isn't in step with that, then you're just focused on what people see. The only reason you're obeying is because you want to look good on the outside. That was the religious leaders that Jesus was having clashes with. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to pick a side, Pharisees and scribes, Jesus, Jesus wins every time. But his way is way convicting because it doesn't stop on the surface. Folks, if you've been a Christian for more than 10 years, you've been going to church for more than 10 years, you know how to fake it. I mean, come on, all of us fake it some every week. We all come in with some kind of mask. Otherwise, there'd be more tears on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon. There'd be more brokenness in the house. There'd be more repentance, more confession of sin, more people up here praying at the end of the... We, we have so little movement in the room, I wonder if anybody was even listening sometimes. I go, well, I, I cannot read this and not be changed. But see, I've had the advantage of all week. I can do it in the privacy of my own home. It's not fair, but it's, you know, part of the gig. I get to repent right all there and just cry my own Bible all by myself. But when you hear it and don't respond, what does that mean? And I know that many of you respond, you just wait to respond and, you know, God knows it's up to, it's between you and him. But I mean, usually when there's conviction in the house, there's some evidence of that, right? I mean, we've seen it in services happen before. And some of that, we just, we have cultural issues. We have issues. We have our masks on. We have our costumes on. We're good at faking it, okay? Superior righteousness. The people were freaking out when they heard verse 20. You're telling me we've got to be more righteous than the super righteous scribes and Pharisees? And Jesus is like, oh yeah, but I'm not talking about beating them at their own game. I'm talking next level, squared. They're not even in the ballpark because their righteousness is so shallow because it's all external. It's just skin deep. And these people are impressed with them. See, they weren't getting it. They were thinking, if I do the right things outwardly. So you can come at this and go, okay, Darren says I need to obey the word and follow the commands of the Bible. And you can get real serious about this and just following all these rules, and you're still missing the point. We can't do it. We can't obey all this. Well, Darren, what have we been talking about then? What am I, I don't understand. We cannot do this, but through God who's in us, he can do it through us when we cooperate with him. 
when I got this, and I'm slow, it took me a while, when I got this, there was this freedom that I just can't describe to you. I, wow. I don't have to do it. I can literally walk with a clear conscience, and I don't have to have a checklist in my mind. Did I love my neighbor in the last five minutes as myself? I don't know. Did you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength yesterday? I don't know. Probably not. I don't know that I've ever done that. You see what I'm saying? But when the Spirit of God has a hold of your heart, and he prompts you or nudges you or bumps you and says, hey, you know, go help that person out. And you do it, you just obeyed the law. But you didn't obey it like it was a rule on a checklist. You did it because you wanted to. Now, maybe it wasn't easy, but you did it because you don't do anything you don't want to do. Not ultimately, not at the core. We do what we really want to do, which is why there's really no excuse for all the stuff we do that we shouldn't do. You do what you want to do. I do what I want to do. Okay, because if Jesus isn't Lord of my life, guess who is? Me. And I'm doing what I want to do because I'm sitting on the throne, thank you very much. It doesn't usually go well. So, so um, yeah, the four truths. Let's review. Central message of the, of, the, of the Bible. I would say Old Testament, New Testament, this is true. Central message, central person is Jesus, is Lord. It's, it all points to him, and he's the point. Second is that God's word is perfectly, uh, is perfectly accurate in every detail. It's infallible, which means that it can't mislead the one who is genuinely pursuing what is true. And because it's so accurate, I can trust it. It's trustworthy. Okay? And it better be because I'm banking my whole life and eternal life on it. It better be trustworthy to you if you're doing that. Isn't it funny how we will trust the Bible for our eternal life, but we won't trust it for this life? That's so, I'm so messed up. I am so messed up, but that's what I think. That's the way I think. That's okay. You're sitting out there listening to me. All right, so then the third one is that God's word should be obeyed or practiced and taught. Now, I love the word practice better than obeyed because it implies that I'm not quite there yet and God's patient with me. I don't like it so much when I go to the doctor and he's practicing on me, but I can't do much about that. Um, and the attorneys do it too. I don't understand. Okay, so, um, but, but I need to obey it. I need to do what it says, not just learn it, but do it. And then I need to teach others. That's the passing on part. Parents, grandparents, friends, people who are breathing. If you follow Christ, who are you teaching? Who are you sitting across the table from on a regular basis, weekly, and you're looking them in the eye and you go, okay, so how is God working in your life today? What are you learning today? What is God saying to you today? What are you doing about that? You're taking responsibility for your little piece of turf that God has given you to take responsibility of, and you're saying, I'm not going to, to wash my hands of the people who live, work, and play around me. I'm going to own some of this. And if it's one person you're pouring into, then one person, okay? And I'm talking about beyond your family. Now, parents with little kids, right there, all in. Deal with those little kids. They are 24-7. I, I get that. Been there, done that. And then the last one is the focus on the heart and the spirit of the law. Um, there's a funny book out there. I'm trying to remember the title of it. It's by A.J. Uh, a. Jacobs or A.H. Jacobs, um, and he is a, a non-Orthodox Jew who decides one day, I think he just wanted to write the book, he decides, I'm going to take the whole Bible and I'm going to try for one whole year to obey every single law in it. It's a hilarious book to read. You should absolutely read it. Okay? And so he, on the back cover, he's got a picture of himself every month. And his beard's getting thicker and thicker and thicker because you're not supposed to trim your beard. So ladies, sorry, you can't trim your beard. But you know what I'm saying? He's all through, as you grow older and older. And then, and he's, and he's trying to obey all these laws and he's commentary, making commentary on them throughout. And I'm dying laughing at him trying to do this. And once in a while, he would stumble across, he would stumble across a truth or say a question. I'd be like, oh, is he going to say something profound? And then he would make light of it and move on. And I'm like, oh, you missed it. And then he gets to the New Testament and he's trying to be like Jesus in his own 
some strength. I'm telling you, if you're looking for something fun to read at night when you can't sleep, check that book out. Gosh, I can't remember the title of that book. I'm going to have to send that out. But um, A Year of Living Biblically. A Year of Living Biblically. I think that's the title. Jacobs is the author's last name. And you know, it would drive you crazy. I mean, just reading the book, you're like, this guy's so nuts. Of course he's doing this to write this book. What a brilliant idea. I wish I had thought of it. Oh my goodness, his wife was about to kill him. It was great, the things they were having to do and not do. Um, things they couldn't have in their house. All, the, all those laws that don't matter. The civil law, the ceremonial law. He was trying to obey those too. Now, he didn't go sacrifice anything. So, you know, there's no blood. But, um, you know, anyway. But the moral law in the Old Testament, timeless. The Spirit of God, the new covenant. God has given us what we need to do what he's called us to do. So don't beat yourself up. If you're walking around going, do not walk away from this going, all right, I've got to obey every stinking command in that book. Don't do that to yourself. There's no joy in that. The Spirit doesn't just bring the ability to know what you're to obey. The Spirit brings the joy in wanting to obey. Okay? That's the biggest thing. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. Know Jesus, and he'll give you the want to to go with the ought to. Let's pray. Lord, I wish somebody had told me this a long time ago. I would have probably felt a lot less guilty a lot of the time. I thank you for your word. It is a gift. You chose to reveal yourself to us in our language so that we could know our creator personally. You made a way, even though we became the traitor race humanity. Of all your creatures that you created, we're the only ones that have rebelled against you. And yet you made a way for us to get back to reconcile, be reconciled with our God. And you sent a second Adam to, to help us undo what the first Adam did. Jesus. You sent Jesus to make a way for us to learn how to walk in your spirit, obeying the desires of your heart. Your law is written in our hearts when we know Jesus. But God, people don't know Jesus. We are surrounded with people who don't have a relationship with you, God, through your Son. Some people in this room don't have that relationship yet. God, we need you to speak, to reveal yourself to these folks. It would change our world. Lord, let's just start with changing their world. Open their eyes right now. May the scales fall away. May faith be kindled, and may they... Find a courage they didn't know they have to say yes to Jesus and to receive you as Lord and Savior. Not just Savior, but Lord and Savior. Jesus is Lord. God, help us. Help others do that as we obey your word and teach others to do the same. Help us to have a compassionate heart for our neighbors, to act justly towards them, to love mercy in their lives, and to walk humbly with you so fully, God that we would actually care about our neighbors where we live, work, and play, that we'd actually reach out and learn their names and invite them into our lives so that they could see Jesus the way we do. Not perfectly, but sufficiently. For in our weakness, your strength is made perfect. God, we love you. We don't love you enough, but you love us right where we are, just as we are. And yes, you know everything about us and you still love us. Lord, may we re respond to that gracious, merciful love with courage, but with, with gratitude, with faith, with saving faith that results in a life that is lived not just reading the word, but doing the word. Because if we just hear the word and don't do it, we deceive ourselves. We lie to our very selves, and that is not loving ourselves at all. Lord, now as we celebrate the fact that Jesus made this possible by dying in our place on the cross, as we celebrate that, and that's kind of weird, celebrating a death, but it's a death that leads and led to life. May we remember the cross, and may we receive that as a gift, as a reminder that keeps us anchored in reality and in, in eternity. 
to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength because you loved us that way. We thank you for that love. We thank you for the cross and the empty cross because Jesus didn't stay dead. He, he is no longer in the tomb. And therefore, I have hope. I will live forever resurrected in your kingdom. And we can all have that hope when we trust in Christ. Thank you for your word that tells us all of these things and more. May we fall more in love with it. May we read it and do it and teach others to do the same. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.